this message is political, but probably not in, to the degree or extent that you think. The recent midterm elections here in the United States, I saw one thing when I saw it, I was grieved. And I had nothing to do with the decision. And I didn't know the person was up for re-election. When I saw that Gavin Newsom was re-elected as governor of California, I was like, wow. As an outsider, I've seen things he's done to make a mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. I saw the policies that he implemented during COVID. I know there's a recall election and apparently he narrowly missed being voted out. But he was reaffirmed. And by reaffirming him, it was like people giving him a pat on the back to keep on doing the things he's been doing. An abortion came up, especially after the reversal of the Roe v. Wade decision during the summer of this year, 2022. And that's where things that he's been confronted on before became even more blasphemous. It's one of the things when things aren't dealt with. If you feed a snake, it will only grow larger. It's not gonna morph into something else. And if you see a, a baby snake, snake, it is only going to grow into a larger snake. Wishful thinking is not going to change it. I remember the last time I saw a copperhead. It wasn't an adult copperhead. It was a baby copperhead with a distinctive yellow tail. And I knew that even as a baby copperhead, it still had the ability to, to bite. It still had fangs. It still had venom. It was arguably even more dangerous than an adult snake who would avoid certain confrontation or only inject enough venom that is necessary. But again, that little copperhead, I knew all it was going to grow up to be is to be a big copperhead. And when the Lord gives you a glimpse of a person, whether the person is for him or not, and I know that people can repent, but whether the person is for him or not, and you don't respond accordingly, then the consequences may be more to bear. And some of you say, why are you speaking about politics? Shouldn't you be cre preaching Christ and Him crucified? This is linked to it. In the Bible, there are many instances where people had to vote. Joshua told the people about choose which God they will serve. Elijah, confronting the prophets of Baal, Telling the people, if Baal be God, then serve him. But if Yahweh be God, serve him. Giving them a choice. Voting. And a part of the reason why this is also important. Here recently, there have been some activity on Facebook. And one of the things I was inspired to post was being able to discern the lesser of two evils. And why the lesser of two evils? For example, speaking in terms of politics. If there are two politicians and one is going to take you, let me rephrase that. There are two politicians. If one is going to take whichever municipality <laughs> or principality, if you will, down a certain path, and it's a path that will put you at enmity with God, if both are in the same path. One's going to take you there faster or one's going to take you there slower. So you can say, I'm not going to vote for either. But by your vote, your vote of abstentia, you allow others to make the choice for you. And others may choose for some choose someone who's going to take that um that segment of society down a path that image with the Lord much faster. And in a sense, if you had voted for the person who could potentially take you there slower or not at all, in a sense, you get to pull the brakes. I know some will say, well, voting doesn't matter and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you get 
who and sometimes what you vote for. There's going to be a lot in this message. And a part of the reason about discerning the lesser of two evils, because there is a major voting event that took place in the Bible where Pontius Pilate gave the people an opportunity to vote. Vote for Barabbas or Jesus the Christ. In that case, it wasn't the lesser of two evils. It was the case between the perfect Lamb of God. And yes, it was God's will for His Son to sacrifice His life. And I've said this before, would you have wanted to vote for Jesus' crucifixion even though you knew that was God's will? And even on that day, there are some people who voted for Barabbas, or correction, there are some people who voted for Jesus to get crucified, but then there are some who are silent. And not that I'm criticizing their silence, but Jesus' disciples who are around, for one, they were outnumbered. But in a sense, because they didn't vote, the only votes that counted were those who were saying, give us Barabbas, and speaking about Jesus, crucify him. So the thing about choosing lesser of two evils, even that is an important part of discernment. And on that day, when people had the ability to vote, to either vote to release Jesus or Barabbas, they voted for Barabbas. Spiritually, it was great for the world. But who makes that kind of choice? So there was a post on Facebook about the ability to choose between lesser of two evils, if that is what it comes to. Then there's also this. Now this was from a couple of days ago. And again, this message, what, today is the 14th. So it's been almost a week since election day. And this message has been kind of percolating within me to deliver. So two days ago, I was inspired to post this. There are many ways to determine how the world is separated. One of the ways is those who have the mind of Christ versus those who do not. Sadly, evidenced by them loving what God hates and hating what God loves, many professing Christians do not have the mind of Christ Jesus. I'm going to call some names. I wonder why there is a viral video of quote-unquote Reverend Al Sharpton rebuking others and standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ as opposed to basically nodding his head and coming to agreement with the sinful things that God hates. I wonder why Raphael Warnock, supposed to be a man of God, doesn't stand up for unborn children. I wonder why Creflo Dollar had Stacey Abrams in his congregation encouraging his people to vote for her rather than rebuking her for her stance on abortion and even claiming that the sound of a child's heartbeat in a womb is something that's manufactured to dehumanize unborn children. And some people you may focus like, hey, they're all black or Afro-American. Why are you focusing on them? I'm not looking at this in a sense from political party, even I'm going to say things, or from the perspective of color. This is a part of having the mind of Christ, where even though those individuals mention of, of my skin color, it is not about looking at their skin color. It is about the mind of Christ. And especially when a person professes to be a Christian or a variation thereof. Some people are Catholics. And if you ask them, hey, um, do you believe in Jesus? They're like, oh, yes. Oh, so you're a Christian. More than likely, a person is going to say that they're a Catholic. Similarly for a Mormon. So this is about having the mind of Christ, where it is looking beyond color and looking beyond political party. To truly look 
for what and who you're voting for. And a part of the reason why I mentioned those individuals' names, Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. So Al Sharpton, for any time that he's been given a platform that he has and he doesn't stand up for the things of Jesus while allowing people to call him a reverend, it's going to count against him heavily on the day of judgment. Creflo Dollar, large platform. Raphael Warnock, these are just but a few. I live here in Kansas and it was absolutely appalling that for the Democrat Party, the thing that kept on getting forced in my view was about abortion. That became the main issue. Now, Republican Party may focus on more monetary things, the economy. And based on feedback from the election, it would seem as if the gods, lowercase g-o-d-s, as if Molech, one who craves child sacrifice, won out more than Mammon, the god of money. Yet, money is still involved. So I kept on seeing things about abortion, abortion, abortion. Was it Anne Hathaway was on The View and speaking about abortion as if it is something merciful? Like I mentioned, this started when I, well, the abortion thing was before your election. When I saw that Gavin Newsom was reelected, a part of my thing was, if something happens in California and he does the people the way he did in times past and the people cry out to the Lord, how long is it going to take the Lord to respond? Because sometimes, like the book of Judges, it shows how because the Israelites strayed away from the Lord, started serving other gods that he had warned them not to serve. The Lord allow enemies to afflict them, and then did cry out to the Lord. But like with California, how long, if something happens, will the Lord uh, make Californians cry out to them before he has mercy on them? And that is if he does, because the Lord has that choice. And then I see that Dan Andrews, the premier of Victoria in Australia. Victoria, not only the most locked down state in Australia during the, in the COVID outbreak, one of the most locked down places in the world. Things that law enforcement officers did to people for simple violations at the time. And in two weeks, he's up for re-election. And if the people re-elect him, they can't say that they didn't know what they're getting into if something comes up in the future and they need to cry out to the Lord for help. If you have ever been in a position where the Lord delivered you, one of the things after that is to not get back into that situation, especially with the same individual or individuals. Jesus said when a demon is cast out, of a person, it is in a dry place, and it wants to say, let me return to my house. And if he sees the house swept clean and is empty, it reoccupies, and not only that, it calls for some other spirits more wicked than itself, and the state of the person is worse than the first. There are many ways demonic entities can re-enter a person. But again, if it happens, it's going to be worse. If the person engages in sin and the person cries out to the Lord, it doesn't make sense for the Lord to allow the person to suffer the consequences a little bit to the point where the person is like, Lord, I'd much rather you kill me ahead of time, take me off this earth, take me to heaven, than have me continue going down this path because they do not want any more of that. So it's like, how long would a person or a group need to suffer 
to say I've had enough of this. Now I spoke about a demon re-entering a person. As we see in the book of Daniel, he spoke about an angel visiting him, but there was difficulty because the angel was locked in a battle with the prince of Persia, an evil principality, and the archangel Michael came to help. There are principalities over areas. Now regarding Joe Biden, some warnings have gone out regarding what would happen if people voted for him. One of the things with the southern border, it is described as porous. People are coming in from all over. Have you ever considered that the way they're saying that millions of people have come over the border since he has taken over the United States? The amount of millions of people that have come in. Imagine how many evil spirits have been allowed into this country because perversion has been even more glorified in a little less than two years. There's the issue of unborn children. There's also the issue of children who are not even old enough to serve in the military, not even old enough to vote, making decisions with their bodies to destroy God's creation. And by God's grace, there are people who are coming out of that deception and they regret the decision. Young women who got double mastectomies, took hormone treatment, genital revision, now regret those decisions and are trying to go back, but they can only go back so far. Men who fell under the satanic delusion, the demonic delusion, that they are supposed to be women, having their male genitalia, some portions removed, and the penis cut, folded inward to create a pseudo vagina. It is one thing for a person Who's above age 18 to make those decisions? What's well, another thing for children? When you vote, you're voting for a lot. When you don't vote, you're still voting for a lot. And people are going to do things in order to get votes. And especially since they're two predominant parties here in the United States, people are going to do things for votes. But what are you voting for? In 1 Samuel 8, the people of Israel wanted a king to rule over them like to be like other nations. The Lord allowed it. But before the Lord did, he had the prophet Samuel tell them the things they're going to face because of having a king over them. In addition, having the king over them meant they were rejecting God as their king. And they still said, we want a king to rule over us. So the Lord gave them what they wanted. There were consequences. That was a vote also. They can vote to keep the Lord as king or vote to have a man rule over them. Both votes would have consequences. Earthly vote with spiritual implications. The first king over Israel was King Saul. He could not protect them the way Yahweh could and did. Saul did not have angels at his command. Choices have consequences. There are many instances in the Bible where people voted and because of that vote had consequences. There are many examples in the Bible where because of the ruler over a nation, the Lord's judgment came upon that nation. And sometimes a part of the Lord's judgment is to give a certain leader. A lot of times people think that God is divorced from the things that happen here on earth. But in Daniel 2, 
the prophet lets us, lets us know the Lord, he's the one who raised up kings and pulled them down. What have you been voting for? Not necessarily who, but what? What kind of demonic entities are behind some of these individuals? Have you looked at that? And a part of knowing is by having the mind of Christ. I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff from the scriptures, but a big part of this is consulting the Lord, having the mind of Christ. A part of that is with the help of the Holy Spirit, giving you cautions. Sometimes he may warn you in a dream. It's like, no, this person looks this way, is saying this, but this person is not going to be like that, or this person is not like that. It is all a facade. And I find it difficult that the Holy Spirit would encourage a child of God, even though the Holy Spirit is part of Godhead, but a child of God to vote a certain way that is heavily rooted in an antichrist agenda. So again, based on this post, there are many ways to determine how the world is separated. One of the ways is, to, is those who have the mind of Christ versus those who do not. Sadly, evidenced by them loving what God hates and hating what God loves, many professing Christians do not have the mind of Christ. And by the way, for, for some very special reasons. What well, basically turns out to be a meme, the background color is red. Red. Are you about the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you about making sacrifices to other gods? And then there are two emojis, one of a sheep, another of a goat. And as someone who has a mind of Christ, you know exactly why that is. If you're not sure yet, you'll find out here in a few. So now I'm going to hit up some scriptures regarding the mind of Christ. And especially when I see someone like on television and a person is professing to be a, a reverend, like someone I saw this morning, a minister and she was speaking about others and I'm like this woman says she's a minister but she doesn't know God doesn't know God at all it's one of the cases of a blind leading the blind and unfortunately with some media organizations they will find a minister who will affirm what they're doing. A minister who will not stand up and give people the heart and mind of God regarding certain things. But also in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, where the Lord spoke about if there's a prophet or dream of dreams who arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, tells you something and it comes to pass, but leads you to another God about not following that prophet or dream of dreams and that the Lord is testing you to see if you love him so if some minister is coming and is encouraging you to vote for a certain person or a political party and it's steeped in the Antichrist and with this I'm not even telling you to vote Democrat or Republican because like one Democrat congressman that I know of He's pro-life. So I'm not telling you to vote Democrat or Republican when you're voting about having the mind of Christ. As I said in a recent broadcast, if you speak to me at 6 a.m., 
the level of the Holy Spirit that's in me, the type of conversation is going to be the same as if you spoke to me at noon. A little bit later in the afternoon. At midnight. It's not going to change. And likewise, having the mind of Christ. Let him influence, especially when you're going to vote. People voted for Barabbas and voted to have Jesus crucified. There's a vote that is coming up and people are going to vote for the Antichrist. Not like the, the many Antichrists around this world, but they're going to vote for the Antichrist. Things are going to go well for a while and then things are going to flip. A part of the Bible where at the Last Supper, Jesus asked his disciples, or told his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. None of them came out and said, oh, we know it's Judas. And even Judas himself said, Master, is it I, knowing he had already set the conditions to betray Jesus. They couldn't discern he was the one. Likewise, people are going to fall for the Antichrist. And if you're around for that vote, I pray that you vote the right way. If you're for the vote, to take the mark of the beast or not, and to worship his image, I pray you vote the right way. I'm going to start with some scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, I said, I'm going to start in verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. And the same mind is actually referring to the mind of Christ. Being more like Jesus Christ. And there's a there's a, um, a hashtag and also a, a comment in the last several years about what would Jesus do? Likewise, what would he do? For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by close people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Remember who you are and whose you are. And a commentary I heard this morning, they spoke about a political candidate and they spoke about the candidate's past. And apparently the candidate said something about being saved by God's grace. Aren't we all who are saved? But they kept on bringing up stuff in a person's past, and I've said many times, I don't like when I hear people say stuff and they bring up someone's past, and it's their distant past, because are you digging up something that's been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul, who I'm reading here, he did some horrible things, but the Lord redeemed him didn't hold those things against him. So we, especially as professing Christians, have to be careful about things from a person's distant past that they have truly repented of, that we're not bringing up those things as if they're contemporary issues. That we don't disqualify people by saying this person is no longer qualified or this person is a hypocrite because now this person is speaking out against these things that he or she did before. There's a difference between what a person did before and it's not doing anymore. A part of repentance is changing our mind, changing our positions, and that is okay. Changing our positions to come in alignment with Jesus Christ. So if I hear someone shooting down another person, using arguments to beat another person, to make it seem as if the blood of Jesus Christ isn't sufficient enough to cleanse, that's a horrible position to be in. And any professing Christian who does that is at risk of hearing Lord Jesus Christ said, Depart from me, you work for iniquity. I never knew you. 
But when people do things, because for example, in this case, it is politically expedient, it is bad. And a part of me doing this video is not necessarily because of politics. Because I'm not here to stand for either of the main parties in the United States. I'm here to stand for Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here regarding what God loves. God loves righteousness and he loves justice. I love both of those things. A part of righteousness is something that is truthful. Now skip over to 1 Corinthians 2. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superior speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing except nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in impressive or in persuasive words of wisdom, but the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet, we do speak wisdom among those things, among those who are mature of wisdom. And by the way, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Paul spoke about not putting faith on the wisdom of men. And likewise, do not put your trust in a political party. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him guide you into all truth. So again, yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Speaking about passing away, there are some people, simply based on their chronological age, they are too close to meeting the Lord Jesus Christ to be playing these kind of games. And the things that they find politically expedient now are going to be held against them on the day of their judgment. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Again, Jesus' crucifixion was based on votes. Votes among the chief priests and elders, who all they wanted to do was find something to indict Jesus so they could have him crucified. They weren't interested in justice. They were perverting justice. And by the way, speaking about this wisdom, you may notice a lot, of, a lot of rulers of this age, they're stressing climate change. Now, when these rulers are professing Christians or a variation thereof, when they're warning about climate change, are they warning people about going to hell for sin? Because like the Bible, the many stories involving climate change. It was a major climate change. It hadn't rained on the earth until the great flood during the time of Noah. There were droughts in the Bible because people sinned. Lake of Fire and Brimstone, it's going to be real hot. So even this seemingly virtuous thing, Speaking about climate change, at one point it was global warming, but then it turns out that the place wasn't as warm as people were saying it was or would be. So that now they have a term, climate change. And if you don't go as far in your belief as they, they do, they'll call you a climate denier. Because it's also another thing. People can call you names. <laughs> For example, John the Baptist, a righteous man. They said he had a demon. Jesus, they call a drunk, a glutton, and other names. 
but none of those names could stick because what they were saying was not true. And sometimes people, because they may call you a name, it will stop some individuals from speaking the truth. The truth is offensive. Personally, I do things to quote unquote, do my part to take care of the planet. But I'm not gonna go overboard with it. So a lot of people are talking about doing things for the earth. They say they're Christians, but they're not speaking about Christ the way they're speaking about the earth. And they've made the earth their God, or one of their gods. So again, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would have not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which I have has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for them or for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thought of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit, capital S, who is from God, that we may know the things freely given to us by God. I pause for a second. For we have not received, for we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Many people, they've been led by a spirit of the world. Some describe it as the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. So like the thing about caring about the earth, it seems like something noble. But some of the things they've said is not adding up. Things they warned about would happen did not happen. In fact, the opposite happened. Using the spirit of the world, but not pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not going to come from quote unquote saving the planet. Salvation comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Continuing, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised or spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, for he himself is appraised by no one. So when you have the Spirit of God, let him lead you at all times. So if someone is telling you that something is important, the Spirit of God in you should be pointing to the Scriptures to let you know, okay, this person is saying that, but the Word of God says that is ungodly. That is an agenda of the Antichrist. If the Lord looks at us as being fearfully and wonderfully made, and if he knows us before we're even formed in our mother's womb, who's someone else to come along and say something different? That is the wisdom of the world. And even love Moses. If a person caused a woman to miscarry, if the child was brought forth and survived, it wouldn't be as bad as if the child was lost in a miscarriage. There was a price to pay for the person who did that. And in verse 16, For who has known the mind of Christ, or the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him 
but we have the mind of Christ. So we need the mind of Christ. When people are telling us things to make it seem as if this is the best decision, that because we have the mind of Christ, be like, uh uh, there's something more important. Some of the wickedness that have come forth in this time. And it's amazing what they used in their efforts to get votes, even if it meant the death of innocent children. And nothing else inspired the post recently is that it starts with children and the next order are going to be adults, geriatrics, those whose lives they think is no longer worth anything. So especially those who are up there in age making decisions about aborting young children. It is said once a man, twice a child. One day another person is going to be in a position to determine how long they live. In Matthew 25, the Lord spoke something which is linked to the meme I read earlier. In Matthew 25, so in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another. How is he going to separate them? As the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Hmm. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Have you been catching that? The Lord spoke about you doing it to the least of them. Who is the least among us, more so than unborn children? They literally come into this world naked and need to be clothed. On some ballots, was the vote that if a, a doctor tried aborting a child and the child came out of the womb alive to give the doctor the authority, the permission, the legal right to kill that child that by God's grace evaded abortion. I know there are doctors who was in the, they were in the industry and that's what it is, an industry, it's not about health care. Who have repented, and yes, the Lord is gracious enough to forgive, but woe to those who do not. So the Lord spoke about those who did it to the least of them. The least of us are those who have not been born, but they are alive and well in the womb. Even with a with semen collection, when viewed under a microscope, you see the sperm cells moving. They have motility, which could be considered a sign of life. Sperm cells, not one that connects to, um, to an ovum, but just sperm cells moving. And P1 discount dehumanize unborn children. The unborn are the least 
among us. It is not something to glorify. And it's not like people who are pushing abortions to the level. It's not that they're saying, well, if a person has an atopic pregnancy where the fertilized egg is in the fallopian tube, not because of complications, medical complications. Oh, and for a person who has a mind of Christ, rather than in a sense having abortions being the first go-to, they'll start suggesting things like abstinence. Again, there are people out there, they say they're Christians, but they're not standing up for God's agenda. They're more focused on a political party. So again, in verse 40, the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, the least, you did it to me. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The least. The least. When people glorify abortions to such an extent and using that for political purposes God will judge and some will say you're a man what business do you have in this stuff it's a woman's right See, such argumentation is not coming from the mind of Christ. The devil will try to do everything possible to disarm you as if you have no right to speak about certain things. Even to the point where if a man impregnates a woman, find out, finds out that she's pregnant, as if what he has to say is irrelevant regarding the choice to keep or terminate that child. But again, with the mind of Christ, in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Now for Satan and his, um, his minions, oh yeah, they love the shedding of innocent blood, especially the unborn. And they'll try to make it seem like nothing, like it's a light thing to do. But they're natural things that have deep spiritual implication to include the shedding of innocent blood. And there's no blood more innocent than an unborn child who does not get a vote whether the child wants to be created or not, or whether he or she wants to be born. So again, six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination. It includes hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans. Hmm. In Isaiah 5, 7, verse 20, the prophet warned, Woe unto those who call good evil and evil good. So trying to downplay abortion, the brutality of it, calling evil good. A heart that devises wicked plans, 
feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Six things God hates. Six things God hates. Seven are an abomination to him. To include hands that shed innocent blood. And there is no blood more innocent than the least of us, those who are still in the womb. I know there's some people, if they want to start getting argumentative, they may start looking at, oh, so if a man spills his seed, is that murder? Oh boy. Be careful about fruitless debates. In Luke 17, start verse 26. The Lord Jesus Christ said, And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until that day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The Lord mentioned towards the end, it'll be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. And literally, the background behind me, the water, like the days of Noah, the fire from above, the days of Lot. Something both stories have in common. Like I mentioned California earlier, I know there are Christians in California. I know there's a church out there where people question, it, question if those individuals are Christians or not, but I know there are Christians in California. And those who didn't vote for someone who has demonstrated such antichrist tendencies. But the two, or the thing that, or one of the things that the story of Noah and Lot have in common, it speaks about a remnant. Everyone did not get saved. But people were warned. And you never want to get to a position where the Lord hands you over. In the story of Noah, only eight people survived. Everyone else got killed by the climate change event. In the days of Lot, only three people ended up escaping from the city. Everyone else got killed by a climate change event. Even though there were many people there were people who could have gotten out, but they didn't heed the warnings. Some of the primary ones, Lot's two son in, sons-in-law, they were told they thought it was a joke until the fire came, but at that point in time it was too late. Lot's wife, who made it out of the city, was told not to look back. She looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. Only Lot and his two daughters made it out. The Lord has the ability to preserve certain individuals. That may not always be the case. And I've been in positions where being a part of a team, where if one person messed up, everyone would get punished. I didn't like it. Especially if I was doing everything I needed to do, I didn't like getting punished because other people wouldn't get it together. But there's some lessons to learn in it. And I still don't like getting punished because other people are messing up. But the good thing is that as a Christian, if you do suffer with those who in a cause of suffering, is that even if you're to die, you're not going to go to hell with them.
in the book of Romans, and by the way, one of the things that went on during the time of Lot, Sodom, into the point where the men of Sodom wanted to sodomize two angels who were in the form of men. Part of that is lawlessness. The son of perdition whom the Bible speaks about is also known as the son of lawlessness. In Romans 1, start verse 20, it reads, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. So woe to those who are calling themselves Christians, or a variation thereof, but they're not honoring the Lord. They may be going along with partisan lines, as opposed to saying, we are going down the wrong path. If we don't repent of this, there's no way we're going to escape God's judgment. When a person does something like that, they're going to get ostracized. Are going to get fired. And when they're thinking about money more than what is right, it ends up pointing to mammon. So again, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of an incorruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over. You never want to get to a point where the Lord has had enough of you and your sins that he hands you over. You don't want the Lord to wash his hands off you. It's a dangerous position to be in. But warnings will come. And sometimes it's about him showing you true character. But again, if it comes down to the lesser of two evils, can you at least identify the lesser of two evils? Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who, ble who is blessed forever. Amen. Being handed over. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For the woman exchanged natural function for what, for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural affection of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, As I'm saying that, I'm seeing Al Sharpton. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they 
not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And yet sometimes it's not about what people do, but what they approve of. And sometimes giving approval means remaining silent. Don't say anything, become complicit. I'm using this version of the Bible for ease of understanding. Well, 2 Thessalonians 2. I prefer how the King James Version says it, but I'm going to read from this NASB version. In 2 Thessalonians 2, I read from verses 8 through 12. Then the lawless one, lawless, would be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved is important to love the truth and that may include actually it not may it will involve standing up against those who are in your own party whichever party that is also loving the truth the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth Jesus said I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also said, those who worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So if people see others spreading lies and not saying anything, that means they're not standing for the truth. Which means they're not standing for God. In verse 11, For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged the King James Version says damned who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness took pleasure in it and taking pleasure in wickedness starts with tolerating it in Revelation 2 the Lord rebuked the church of Thyatira for tolerating the woman Jezebel who was leading his servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed unto idols. The Lord spoke the same thing about Balaam leading people astray. I'm going to go to the Old, Old Testament a little bit. In the book of Joshua, someone I mentioned before, prior to the battle of Jericho, in Joshua 5, start verse 13. Now, it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us? or for our adversaries. He said, No, rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. So just ask him, are you for us or our enemies? Now the King James Version of the Bible spells it out differently, where he was told, I'm for neither. That encounter it wasn't about being on the Israelite side or the people of Jericho. It was about being on the Lord's side. And when you have the mind of Christ, ultimately, you have to be on the mind of Christ. Jesus could hang out with a bunch of people, but there'd come a point where it's like, oh, well, I can't go any further. So you may have, for example, be in the political sphere or medical field, What's where it is, and you can go get along with other people. 
But there has come a point where if they are not submitted to the Spirit of God, where if in a concert, Romans 8, 14, if they're not being led by the Holy Spirit, there's going to come a point where they're going to want to do something and you are going to have to say, I can't go there with you. For the love of my God, I cannot go there with you. So the captain of the Lord's host said, I'm not neither. Even though he showed up to help the Israelites, neither. He was on God's side. John the Baptist, he wasn't on the side of the, the chief priest. He wasn't on the side of King Herod. He was on the Lord's side. So again, no, rather I indeed come as captain of the hosts of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face. In fact, in Ephesians 6, it speaks about us being ambassadors of Christ. As an ambassador, you shouldn't be bound the knee to another God. Lowercase G-O-D. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? Are you submitting to those who are not submitting to God? And by submitting, I'm not just speaking about obeying the laws of the land, but are you bound down to things that God has commanded you not to? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Many people are bound down to other gods. Idolatry. Now mention about you get what you vote for. Because as it is written in Ephesians 6 verse 12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I saw something recently where because of the reversal of Roe v. Wade that sent the decision back to the states. So each state or each state gets to come up with their own abortion laws. How permissive or how restrictive it is. But a striking down of that decision was a major thing. And from the kingdom of darkness, they have everyone marked who had anything to do with the reversal of that decision. Because I saw something recently, I'm not sure where it was, but I think there was a part of a lawsuit. But because of the reversal of Roe v. Wade, I think like in one month in a certain area, 10,000 abortions were not able to be performed. That meant 10,000 babies who would have been killed are being allowed to be born. I know some people use the argument about rape and incest, but the stats I've seen speaks about that being like 1% of the cases that results in an abortion. So 10,000 that's blood the enemy wants and cannot get. And in turn, he wants the blood of those involved in cutting off his supply. But of course, what the enemy can't get one way, he'll try to get another. So if he can't get innocent blood, he'll try to get other blood. Going back to the time of Noah, the Lord spoke about the life force being in blood. Sins were atoned for by the shedding of blood. Covenants are formed by the shedding of blood. It is used in the kingdom of darkness. And for a while, the shedding of innocent blood, unborn children in the United States, was a big thing for the enemy. 
flipping to the prophet Isaiah. In a sense, it's going to kick things up a notch. God is gracious, but as we saw in Romans 1 and 2 Thessalonians 2, he will turn people over to their sinful activities, and they're going to reap the prices, the consequence of their actions. In Isaiah 1, start verse 15 through 20. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. It can get that bad, where people actually start crying out to the Lord and he refuses to hear. So again, so when you spread your hands in prayer, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Whichever nation you're in, you never want to get to the position with the Lord, where you're praying to him and he stops listening. And if that doesn't serve like the God or sound like the God whom you serve, imagine how many persons are going to be crying out when it's time for the lake of fire and brimstone. And even though they're going to be crying, the Lord will no longer hear. So again, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. If we're supposed to defend an orphan, should we also defend the unborn? Defend the orphan. Plead the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the Lord spoke about not seeing when they pray, not hearing when they cry out. Yet he offers mercy to not let things get to that point. In Exodus 32, Moses cried out to the Lord for him not to judge or bring the judgment he was going to do upon the Israelites for worshipping a golden calf. The Lord had mercy upon them. They still paid a price, but he had mercy upon them. The same Moses, when he interceded for Miriam, who the Lord struck him with leprosy, the Lord wouldn't entertain it. Miriam had to live with her leprosy for seven days. The Lord allowed her to suffer for a while to learn a lesson. The Lord is gracious, but he cannot allow certain things to continue, and he will not allow it to continue indefinitely. So if someone is trying to get you to vote for them, using an Antichrist agenda, watch out. Also in Isaiah 59, start verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it can save, nor is his hair so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin is a problem. But especially when a person is supposed to be a minister of Jesus the Christ, and they're in a position, even in a secular job, where they're not standing for the things of the Lord, it's an issue. They're going to have to give an account of themselves to the Lord. And to whom much is given, much is required. For your hands are defiled with blood. This blood thing again. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one sues righteously, and no one pleads honestly. 
they trust in confusion and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. Who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a snake breaks forth. Their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. And an act of violence is their hands. Their feet run to evil. And they hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Devastation and destruction are in their highway. They do not know the way of peace and there is no justice in their tracks. They have made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, but behold, darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. Speak about God. And our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us. And we know our iniquities. I pause for a second. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it speaks about those who will be cast into lake of fire and brimstone. It speaks about the cowards, fearful liars. So if people are in a position to speak up for the things of God, but they're not doing it. Revelation 21, verse 8. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street and upright rightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight, that there was no justice. In Genesis 4, the Lord warned Cain that sin was crouching at his door, but he must rule over him. Cain killed his brother Abel, and the Lord said he heard, or he could hear, Abel's blood crying out from the ground. Don't you think shed blood from innocent children are crying out to the Lord? Is that something? The Lord can block hearing people's prayers because they're so sinful. But he can hear the blood of the unborn crying out to him. As he said, the life force is in the blood. He can hear the blood crying out, as was the case with the death of Abel. And going to the prophet Jeremiah. Well, sometimes it seems as if people forget about this side of God. In Jeremiah 7, verse 16, it is written, The Lord said, As for you, do not pray for this people, and do not lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I do not hear you. I mentioned like California, imagine things getting to a point in California, and Christians are from California crying out, and the Lord tells them, don't even bother making prayer. And I say these things, now that I'm saying that they will happen. But to warn you, do not let things get that far. Also in Jeremiah 11, from verses 11 through 14, 
Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing disaster on them, which they will not be able to escape. Though they will cry to me, yet I will not listen to them. I just reminded of something a while ago. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they burn incense. But they surely will not save them in the time of their disaster. There's no lowercase g o d s or g o d, lowercase g o d, that can save a person from the Most High God, Yahweh. For your gods are as many as your cities, O Judah, and as many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to the shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. And I think about altars. Many things can become altars, seemingly innocuous things. Like a gynecological table with those two stirrups. It becomes an altar, a place of making a sacrifice, where a woman's womb becomes an infant's tomb. And in verse 14, Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not listen when they call to me because of their disaster. Do not let things get to this point where God will not even listen. To include, listen to the intercession of his servants, his children. Also in Jeremiah 14 verses 10 through 12. Thus says the Lord to this people, even so, they have loved to wander, go astray. They have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now, he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. See, Jesus paid the price for our sins. That's a price we couldn't pay for ourselves or by ourselves. On the old covenant, the shedding of blood only covered sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ, it cleanses all sin and unrighteousness. There's a difference. We could not pay the price. Jesus did. So the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the welfare of this people. When they fast, now this is serious, when they fast, I'm not going to listen to their cry. And remember the city of Nineveh, the Lord sent Jonah there. The people repented. They humbled themselves in fasting and praying, crying out to the Lord for three days, and the Lord relented of his decision. Of course, as we see in the book of Nahum, the prophet Nahum, Nineveh was eventually destroyed. But the Lord had mercy upon the Ninevites, 120,000 of them, because of their humility. What happens is people, they become hardened in their sin, loving it, especially after justifying it, and also supporting others who are in sin. Even to the point where it could get, where even prayer and fasting will not help. So again, when they fast, I am not going to listen to their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I'm not going to accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end of them by sword, famine, and pestilence. It is important to stand up for the Lord, to stand for the truth, despite the personal cost to you. Because the enemy will push you to the absolute limit to see how willing you are to stand for the Lord. In the book of Daniel, chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verses 13 through 28. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had his men build a golden idol. 
that when people heard of sound, they had to worship. That was a decree by the king. What are three men? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Hebrews. They were not going to comply. It made the king angry. Their life was at stake. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. <laughs> but if you do not worship, you will be immediately, or you will immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? There's some things going on right now. And there are people who are in the fire to cave to the powers that be. And some have made a decision that they won't. But in this case, it's almost like a political party accosting someone who has gotten out of line and is trying to make them line up with the establishment, as some would say. And who's going to dare speak up for the Lord and against unrighteousness? Because what Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were doing, their lives were at risk, being burned alive. Many people today aren't facing such dire situations. And then the king is saying, which God could deliver them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Again, there are certain debates don't get into. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We are still required to be this resolute in our faith, to not bow down to certain things. Can you imagine if Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, if they had to be a witness against you by saying, we faced a fire, but we stood firm in our faith. But they spoke about their God being able to save them, but even if he doesn't. And Jesus spoke about, do not fear him who can kill a body and no more, or fear him who can kill a body and cast body and soul into hell, fear him. Do not fear anyone more than you fear the Lord. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's 
So the one who executed the king's orders, they got killed by the fire. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Something miraculously, miraculous had already taken place. Those who tossed them into the fire, or were supposed to, they died. But it says that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they fell into the furnace, but they were still tied up. So the fire that killed the others had not killed them. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. He wanted to see which God could save them, and he was finding out. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. I pause. The enemy will try to punk you out. Ephesians 6, 12, we don't arrest against flesh and blood. So it could be one of his servants. And that person who's serving the devil is standing adamant to his or her faith. And a part of the test is to see if you are going to stand firm in your faith. Because if you don't believe in your God enough to stand firm in your faith despite the cost, then they have no reason to respect you. See, if Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego had died, at least they could have said, or there's a possibility they would have said, you know what, they died, but at least they believed in what they were standing for. Many Christians today, they say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they won't stand for him. And it doesn't take a fire for them to back away from him. And in verse 28 of Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies, so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. They earned the king's respect. Oh, by the way, this didn't humble the king. Because in Daniel 4, the Lord had to deal with the king to humble him until he gave homage to the Lord. We see another incident in Daniel 6 where Daniel's co-workers set him up so that the king would throw him into the lion's den for violating a law. But the Lord preserved Daniel. And when the king pulled Daniel out after his night's stay, he made a decree. Let me pull it up here. In Daniel 6, verse 25, Then Darius, the king, wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, 
may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. The king, because of Daniel's actions, made that decree about his God. But when you have Christians bowing their knee and capitulating for simple things, they will not get the respect they're striving for. And worst of all, they put themselves at enmity with the Lord. So at least in these two situations, yes, they could have died, but the Lord preserved them. So I spoke about do not let things get so bad where the Lord may not hear prayers anymore. But the last two examples show that the Lord can preserve his children. Oh, by the way, those who set Daniel up to get thrown to the lion's den, when Daniel was taken out, they and their families were thrown in, and the lions ripped them apart before their feet touched the ground. God loves justice. Also remember this, God is able to protect. And even if something costs you your life, the most important thing is the Lord will look at you and say something to the effect of well done, my good and faithful servant, and welcome you into his kingdom. Welcome you into heaven. As opposed to saying, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. The Lord can protect. So like in the case of California, for his faithful remnant, the same way he protected Noah, the same way he protected Lot, he can protect those who are his. But if you are the Lord's, ensure that you are standing for him, and they don't put anything. Jesus spoke about if you love your mother or father more than him, you're not worthy of him. So if you love a political, political party, more than the Lord, you're not worthy of him. Repent of all idolatry. Stand firm in your faith for the Lord. In Exodus 8, to show the Lord's protection or his ability to protect, is in Exodus 8, verses 20 through 23. Now the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh. As he comes out of the water and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you do not let my people go, behold, I'll send swarms of flies on you and on your servants and on your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of, fly, of flies, and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign will occur. Hmm. Of course, also in the day of Passover, those houses with the lentils covered with the blood, they were protected from the destroyer. It shows the Lord's ability to protect. And a part of standing firm in faith is standing for the things of the Lord, knowing that He can protect, He can provide. Everything you receive in this life was by His grace anyhow. So do not bend 
the knee to the enemy. Do not bow. Do not put another God before the Most High God. Do not put skin color above God. Do not put a political party above God. It is costly being a disciple of Lord Jesus Christ. And we truly have to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow Him. In Revelation 12 11, it says, We overcome the enemy with the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives when faced with death. Some people are doing things just for the sake of money. And sometimes those who are doing things for money, it's almost like it doesn't even make sense because they are already rich. Do not allow anything to become an idol in your life. Either you're going to fall in your idol or your idol is going to fall in you and grind you to powder. So about the election. You got what you voted for. If someone came with an antichrist agenda, you got a devil in your midst. If you didn't vote for the person, there's still an antichrist agenda, if that is what is prevailing. If you need to repent, please do so. But on this day, choose which God you will serve. Prayerfully, you will choose the Lord Jesus Christ and you will serve him faithfully for the rest of your days. God bless you, and Jesus the Christ is Lord.